interesting. Hey. Uh, let's get back into it. Last time we introduced. Last time. We introduced something called an improper integral. So this means you have an integral f to the a, a, b, da where either your f of x is not continuous at some points in the interval a, b, or your b is equal to infinity, or your a is equal to negative infinity. Right? So you can have several of these happening at the same time. And we call that an improper integral. And we saw how to actually break it up. Uh, I want to introduce another definition here. So I told you how to actually computationally start dealing with these guys. Basically what you're going to do, figure out the bad points. Where is your function discontinuous? Or if your uh, points are infinity or negative infinity. You want to break the integral up using that sum rule for integrals. And so that you only expose one bad point per integral. And you kind of approach that point using limits, right? Either from the right or from the left. But that's kind of where we stopped, and we're going to finish up those examples. But I want to tell you what happens whenever these limits actually work out. Um, so, definition. We say an improper integral. Converges. Right, so that's the key word here. So it converges to L if its corresponding limits sum to L, or more generally, to a finite number. Otherwise, we say it diverges so you'd break this limit up the the integral up so that you have one bad point per integral you'd approach these with a limit you do the integrals the way that you've normally done applying whatever integration technique you would need to apply but apply the fundamental theorem of calculus then you take the limits now once you take the limits you're going to get some sort of answer. You're going to get some number as the answer, or you're going to get infinity or minus infinity, or it's going to be like be a does not exist D and E. Now, in the case that it converges, that means that the limit is actually just a number. It's a real number. In all other cases, we say it diverges. It'll either diverge to infinity or negative infinity, or it just it does not exist because it's just bouncing up and down and not settling anywhere. So that is the phrase that we use when these limits actually exist. And it turns out convergence. There are many ways you can interpret this, but it can be interpreted as the area under the curve. So we can still talk about uh, this guy as an area, which normally you could do that, but it's a little more vague when one of these issues happen. But we actually could define the convergence to be the area under, the net here under the curve, as in Kelvin. So those are some important terminology. So right now, I want to do some in, go through problems in their entirety for the improper integrals. Um, I had you guys start starting to work on some. We are going to do those as well as others. So at the examples. One to infinity of one over x squared, plus zero to one of one over x squared, 
because there's infinity of 1 over x squared. phrase this in a different way, but now with this terminology I can actually phrase it in another way. For what values of p does this integral converge? And so those are the uh, examples that we had set up. Let's jump into them. A, how do we how do we deal with that? That one is infinity. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, you just do limit as n approaches infinity. All right, nothing to break up. There's only one bad point here, and he's already exposed. That's the infinity guy. Um, this function has an issue at x equals 0, but we're on the interval from 1 to infinity, so the 0 is not going to be an issue. Um, so, what do we do now? Integrate it. You're going to integrate. So you leave the limit. So the limit is going to hang out until you actually finish this integral. How do you integrate that? Negative 1 over x. Right? You would, you would think of this as x to the minus 2, do the power rule. It's negative 1 over x between 1 and n. So you're going to go in, you're going to plug in the n minus, which now becomes a plus, you're going to plug in the 1. And what happens here? What's that limit? That's 1. That's 1, because this part here goes to 0, so it's 1. So in other words, you can say that this guy, you can say the integral of 1 to the infinity of 1 over x squared dx converges to 1. Right? You can make that statement. And everyone's going to know what you mean. Right? Once we take the limit, it actually works out. It gives you a finite number. That number is going to be 1. Now, in terms of interpretation, what is this actually saying? Well, this is saying that if you look at the function 1 over 1 plus x squared, 1 over x squared, you know that that's what the function looks like. And we're saying that if you start at 1 and go off to infinity, it turns out the area under that curve, as strange as it might sound, is actually 1. Right? Now, notice that this guy never actually touches the x-axis, right? So it, it's almost like this is, goes on forever, right? It's never going to actually hit zero, but it turns out there comes a point where the error is never going to be bigger than one. It will, uh, yeah, the area converges to one. The area under that is one. So it's kind of strange to think about it that way, but um, there's <coughs> no better way to think about it if that's how you want to look at it. Because if you were to say, it, it would be wrong to say that there is infinity. It definitely doesn't go that large. And it never passes 1. But if you pick any number smaller than 1, eventually the area will surpass that value. So it's like, man, it, it's equivalent to 1. It has to be 1. It can't be anything else. So that's how you can interpret this. And this is, you know, it's a simple example to start with. But uh, that's how you do a full problem. Any questions on this one? So, That's how you do it. Uh, this is one way you can interpret it geometrically. Let me shut this over first, though. Okay. Uh, let's look at another one. So B.
Now B is looking at the same guy, but it's looking at a different area. Sorry, so, so if you were to sketch this, this is talking about from 0 to 1. What is the area under that? Is it going to add up to a finite number like that guy? So now what? What's the bad point? Uh, zero. Equal zero. Zero. So we can actually plug in zero because our function is undefined there. So you, but zero is the only bad point here. So you take a limit, say n is approaching zero. For emphasis, you could say from the right, because if we're on the interval zero to one, and we're all the way over here, we're only to the right of zero. Um, of n to one, one over x squared dx. And again, same deal. I'm going to leave this the limit alone until I actually compute the integral, which is going to be this. I'm going to plug in the 1. That's minus 1 plus plug in the n, 1 over n. Now what happens to that as n approaches 0 from the right? Infinity. It goes off to positive infinity. So in this case, we would say it diverges. So this function, if we measure the area under the curve from 1 to forever, it's actually a finite area. It actually is, has an area of 1. But if we try to measure the area under the curve from 0 to 1, like dividing by 0 is such a, a hard thing to get around that even if you're trying to measure it on a finite interval, things just don't work out. Yeah? Do you say it diverges to infinity or would you say it diverges? I would just say it diverges. You could say diverges to infinity, but I'm not going to expect you to get that technical. Just say diverges. It's fine. Yeah. So that one has, there's an infinite area between 0 and 1. But there's a finite area between 1 and infinity. Right? In fact, the area between 1 and infinity is actually quite small. It's just one square unit. Now, the answer to this part should be obvious, but there's a, there's a point in looking at this one. Right? Expect this to converge or diverge? Diverge. Diverge, diverge right? I mean, a little piece of that diverges. So of course, I expect the whole thing to diverge. But there's a, I want to make sure that we can get through the technical aspects of this guy. Uh, how would you do this one? Separate it 0 to 1 and 1 to infinity. So the first thing, again, split up the integral so that you only have one bad point per integral. Um, so here, 0 is the bad guy. Here, infinity is the bad guy. And use a different limit to approach each. So here, approach 0 from the right side. And then 1 over x squared dx. Plus here, someone else approaches infinity. You can only approach infinity from the left. One to n, one over x squared dx. Right. So now you you kind of do these separately. So now the integral are they're going to look very familiar. This guy's going to be one over x between n and one. This guy's going to be minus one over x between one and n. So here you're going to have the limit as n approaches infinity of minus 1 plus 1 over n plus the limit as m approaches infinity of minus 1 over m plus 1. Now, once you start to measure this infinity, this, uh, this limit, we got infinity. Right? So now, here's how we deal with this situation. If you were to measure this one, though, it, it actually goes to 1. But how we will deal with it is we will consider this as being divergent. Right? So it's not going to matter that this guy adds up to 1. Right? It's infinity plus 1. It's still going to diverge. But in, this is a, a general principle that you're going to want to realize, is that you can sometimes have several things that you have to worry about, 
But the moment one of those limits mess up, the whole thing gets messed up. Right? So once you saw that this is infinity, you didn't even have to worry about what that is. It doesn't matter what it is. Right? So once one limit diverges, the integral diverges overall. So knowing that, that can save you a little bit of time. Some of these guys you might have to break up into many parts. Uh, but if you can just like spot with your eye one part that's going to mess up, you can just show, oh, I evaluate this one part and it's messed up. I don't need to worry about the other five or six parts because it's not necessary. Once one part messes up, the entire thing gets messed up. You can just stop. Um, so. That's the lesson you can take away from this one. It's an important lesson. Everyone, all, every single limit, uh, once you break it up, each person is their own limit. You have a different variable approaching the limit. And you think of them as case by case. Any one person gets messed up. The whole thing gets messed up. The party's over. Um, now, this one, again, pretty obvious. But I do want you to practice how to write out a problem, technically speaking. So um, how would this one be fleshed out? <clears throat> so, same kind of function, but the point is not to make the function complicated. I want you to use a C, how to actually deal with the integral in general. Yeah, so. <clears throat> uh, uh, first, do um, integral from negative infinity to 1. And then um, 1 over x squared dx. And then I would add it from 1 to 0. 1 over x squared dx. And then uh, um, 0, 1. And then 1 to infinity. So technically, you want to break it down that way. So now, here's how this can help you out. Um, you know if any one of these guys mess up, um, the whole thing gets messed up. So you don't really have to waste time going through the motions of all of them. You can kind of, you realize that the integral here is going to give you like a 1 over x, and you can spot that this guy is going to expect you to plug in x equals 0. That's not going to work out. So I can kind of see right away that this third integral is going to mess up. By the way, the second integral is also going to mess up. But we already did this one, so it's easier to pick out that one. So I would first start by splitting this up, but then I can just say, you know what, ignore everybody else. Check out this guy over here, right? That guy's going to go to 1 over x between, say, uh, m and 1 limit as m is approaching 0 from the right. And that's going to give you, um, it's going to diverge. That's negative 1, right, on the left? For the integral, when you split up the integrals, it's negative infinity to negative one. Uh, no, he went up to one. He went up to one. Oh. So it's like uh, negative infinity is all the way up here. Infinity is all the way up here. He went to one, then to zero. Uh, he went negative, to negative, negative negative one. Did you put negative one? <coughs> Oh, that, that should have been negative 1. Mm -hmm. Negative 1 to 0. 0 to 1. Yes. OK. Yeah, that should be negative 1. Negative 1. one. Thanks, Serge. Serge is paying attention. Yeah, he okay. was. So now this here diverges. Now once you know that this, this one integral over here diverges, this guy diverges, like the whole thing diverges. Right, so you don't even care what these other guys are doing. You can just immediately say, this guy diverges. What about E? 
What did you guys get for E? take the limit as um, n goes to infinity um, of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, and then that's just the... Well, the 0 to n? 0 to n over 1 plus x squared dx. And the, the integral is just arctag. Mm -hmm. That's tangent inverse. So that is going to look like tan inverse of n minus tan inverse of 0. Okay, now what? When tan inverse of n approaches infinity, For tangent, it's undefined, but for tangent inverse, it's not. Anyone remembers what tangent inverse goes towards as you go up to infinity? One. Zero. <laughs> no, I already just guessed it. Okay, so tangent inverse has two asymptotes. They happen at pi over two and minus pi over 2, and it looks like uh, one of these S's. Right? It's like you take the middle version of the middle section of the tangent and you turn it on its side. That's what your tangent inverse looks like. Um, so this actually approaches pi <coughs> over 2 as you approach infinity. It'll approach minus pi over 2 as you approach negative infinity. Um, you can see from this graph that the tangent inverse of 0 is 0, but you should also just kind of know that if you plug in 0 into a tangent, it's going to give you 0, so it's going to be minus 0. In other words, this guy actually converges. He converges to pi over 2. So the, the 1 over 1 plus x squared graph, that guy actually it looks a lot like a bell curve, it looks like. Where it goes up to, to 1 right here. And if you were to measure the area from 0 to infinity under that guy, uh, it's actually pi over 2. Lucky. That's you know, kind of why it's not exactly the same function. But this is sort of telling you why something like the normal distribution statistics class actually even makes sense. It's really an improper integral when you, you think about it. F, what about this guy? Where is this guy going? Two. Come again? It works at p equals two. Okay, where else? Yeah, we actually did that. We did it. I know for one thing, <laughs> if p is two, it works out. Where else does it work out? Minus one. Would it work at minus one? Oh no. If you had one over x to the minus one, that's just actually the integral of x. That's going to be x squared. Now, if you're if you're even doing that between one and infinity, yeah, Pop that's going to diverge. So, being aware that you can, uh, if you have a negative power down here, you'd be able to flip it and get a positive power of x. That kind of hints you that the negative keys kind of aren't going to work out. Um, so. What you would do here is worry about uh, cases. So, one, 
Let's talk about P is negative. That part is kind of obvious. It's not going to work out. Negative power here means you flip it. You're integrating. You're going to bump the power up. And if your x is going off to infinity, that's going to diverge. So this case is uh, almost pretty easy. What about if we equals 0? Diverges. It's also going to diverge. Notice that that would just be the integral of 1 from 1 to infinity. You integrate 1, you get x. Limit as x goes off to infinity, that's going to be. So now we can think about p greater than 0. Now, as far as the greater than zero situation is concerned, there's one particular value that's going to be different from all the other values. One. One. If your p is one, that guy gives you an ln. In all other cases, it's the power rule. So I would think of that as another case. So what I would do is consider p equals one specifically, but then otherwise consider it greater than zero, but not equal to one. So it turns out when you start thinking about this guy, just knowing about the power rule and how <coughs> integrals work out, you have four distinct cases that you have to worry about. And it looks like most of them intuitively, you can see that they're not actually going to work out in our favor. But let's just go through the motions anyway. So you can't say Javon never showed you. Um, so if we look in case one, if our p is less than zero, Say, set P equals minus K, where K is positive. Then, if I look at it from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the P dx, this is going to be equal to limit as n approaches infinity from 1 up to n of actually x to the K dx. This is going to be the limit as n approaches infinity of x the k plus 1 over k plus 1 to 1 of n. That is going to be n raised to the k plus 1 over k plus 1 minus 1 over k plus 1. Now here I have a fraction. The numerator is going off to infinity. The denominator is staying constant at k plus 1. That diverges to infinity. So it diverges in this case. Second case, p equals 0. Well, this means that your integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx is just going to be 1 to infinity of 1 dx. That is going to be the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 up to n 1 dx. That becomes x between 1 and n. That's the limit as n approaches infinity of n minus 1, which goes off to infinity. So again, diverge. <coughs> to go with the third case. Three P equals one. Now P equals one are one to the infinity of one over x, so the P dx is just going to be one to the infinity of one over x dx. This is going to be the limit as n approaches infinity of one to n one over x dx. Take that integral. You're going to get ln of absolute value x from one up to n. It's ln of n minus ln of 1. Now ln of 1 is 0, but ln of n as n goes to infinity. Log keeps increasing, so that goes to infinity. Diverges again. So three out of four cases, we are diverging. Let's look at this case. P is greater than 0, but it's not 1 specifically. also breaks into two cases. Let's do uh, case four. P is greater than zero, P not equal to one. So. Let's do the case where it's between zero and one. 
is going to happen there. So we are going to have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dp is going to be equal to well, the limit as n approaches infinity, 1 up to n, 1 over x to the p. Well, here I write this as minus x to the minus p. So, of course, we realize that if we integrate that, um, we have our minus p plus 1 over minus p plus 1. 1 to n. So, this is going to be n to the minus p plus 1 over minus p plus 1. Minus. Again, the 1. Now, what is that? What happens to this limit here? And notice that your p is something smaller than 1. What's going to happen? Your p is smaller than 1, right? So like a half. So you take minus a half plus 1, what do you get? You get a positive a half. So you'll actually have n raised to a positive power, right? Now, this here, notice that this is going to be a positive power. Because of this assumption. So that actually diverges as well. That goes off to infinity. That diverges. So between 0 and 1 also doesn't work. So all the negatives don't work. Between 0 and 1 doesn't work. 1 itself doesn't work. Does anything work? Well, hopefully p larger than 1 is going to work. So if anything. If <coughs> none of these work, then this is a whole pointless exercise. But we kind of have a good feeling about this one because it works for p equals 2 specifically. In this case, yes, you're going to plug in that limit. Again, you're going to add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. So this is going to be the limit as n approaches infinity of n raised to the minus p plus 1 over minus p plus 1 minus 1 over minus p plus 1. Now, because our p is larger than 1, this guy is negative. Because of that. So what does that mean? What's going to happen to this term over here? Zero. It's going to go up to zero. And so we're just going to have pretty much 1 over p minus 1. So that guy converges. <laughs> Now, for reasons that will be made clear later, this is actually a pretty important thing to know, which is why I went through the whole process of actually showing it to you. Um, so important that they, they make this claim in a theorem. So this is actually a bona fide theorem. The integral 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the dp converges. if and only if p is larger than 1. So 
that's not a misspelling, that's on purpose. This this means if and only if. So one thing you have to be careful of when you're reading mathematics is that um, it doesn't work like everyday colloquial language. Sometimes people make a sentence in one direction and they kind of mean it works in both directions. In math, this is often not the case. Um, so whenever some, some statement works in both directions, we use the phrase if and only if instead. Yes. So is that like considered like a new rule we can use for that one? The one over p minus one? If you just want to find the convergence two? Yeah. Okay. I don't think it's so, it's so important for you to remember that. I think you should re remember this though. Like overall, it'll give you some meaningful answer if your p is greater than one. That you should remember. Because where we're really going to use this, a lot of the time we won't be able to get to the answer anyway. But we're going to use this to help us talk about other things. Uh, I have a question. Is that only when x is x, or could it be when x is like sine of x? Or if it's no, it's only when x is x. Uh, let's talk about... So, like one more thing I want to talk about in this section. So, recall. Integrals maintain inequalities. This is something that we learned in Calc 1. So if we had some function f of x and g of x like that, and f, g are integrable, meaning we can find their integral, we can find the area under these curves, it's not a problem, <coughs> then integrate both sides, it maintains the inequality. So the inequality sign isn't going to flip around or anything like that. Now that's something you have to, you have to prove technically, but it makes a lot of intuitive sense. If your, if your g of x is always larger than your f of x, then of course the area under g is going to be bigger than the area under f. That just makes a lot of sense. That's what this statement says. If one function is bigger than another, then the area under that function is going to be bigger than the area under the other function. Right? So that's made as this. Another way of thinking of that is integrals maintain inequalities. It turns out we can extend this idea to infinite integrals, in infinite intervals. Right? So you can just start at A and then just go on forever. If it's always true that this guy is bigger, then you're moving on forever, the area is always going to be larger. And this leads to another important theorem, it's right over here. There's something called the comparison theorem. Here's what that says. Suppose fg r integrable and f is always smaller than g for all x greater than or equal to a. Then integral from a to infinity of f of x dx is going to be smaller than the integral from a to infinity of g of x dx. Moreover, so the infinite integral, the in integral on an infinite uh, interval is still going to obey the inequality signs. It's not going to change anything. On top of that, there are more things that we can say here. Two important things. Moreover, if our integral of g 
converges, so does the integral of f. And secondly, if the integral of f diverges, so does g. So this is called a comparison theorem, a very, very important theorem. One, it tells us that uh, the integrals will obey inequalities on intervals of infinite length, but more than that, it tells us that if this guy stops at a number, the guy below him needs to stop at a number because he can't pass it. Right? So if this guy converges to 1, then it means that this integral is going to be stuck between 0 and 1, but we keep adding up areas. So it eventually has to stop, and it can't pass 1. So it's definitely going to have to stop at a number, either 1 or smaller. So if you know that g of x converges to a number, f of x will automatically have to converge. On the other hand, if your f diverges, let's say, well, we know it's not going to diverge to like negative infinity, so if it diverges, it's going to go off to infinity. We keep adding up areas. It's going to blow up to infinity. This guy has to be bigger than that guy. So if this guy goes off to infinity, that guy also has to go off to infinity. So we end up in a situation where if you know the bigger guy converges, the smaller guy converges. And if the smaller guy diverges, you know the bigger guy diverges. Um, I should have mentioned you can't make any conclusions in other cases. So if this guy diverges, you can't say anything about f. I don't know. It could be a number, but it could also diverge itself. Like, you won't know. You know for sure, if this guy stops at a number, that guy has to stop. And if this guy goes off to infinity, that guy has to go off to infinity. The other cases you don't know. Now, why is that nice? Not only are we going to use that in another section, but it's actually nice in this section. Determine convergence of an integral, we can't, as an emphasis on, we can't compute by comparing it. So it's called a comparison theorem, you do by comparison, by comparing it to some other. Here's an example. Let's say you look at that integral. Okay? That guy shows up and asks you, determine whether this integral converges or diverges. Now, if you've been studying the way you should be studying, you are going to realize that, hey, I can't integrate that. None of the integration techniques that we learn can deal with that integral. There's no way I can directly compute that. There's, yeah, there's no Calc 2 way to actually compute this. Right? Um, if we're in complex analysis, we, had a, we have uh, some options. But for Calc 2, yeah, impossible integral. You can't integrate cosine squared x over 1 plus x squared. So doing this the way that we've been doing things isn't going to work out, because you don't even know what you're taking the limit of. Um, but here's what we could do. Note, we know that the cosine function is bounded by 1. So when I square the cosine, that's going to be a value between 0 and 1. This means that this integral here that I care about 
course, you take something that's always positive divided by 1 plus x squared, that's always positive. So this whole integral is definitely going to be positive, and it's also going to be less than this whole integral. Because right? the cosine squared is less than 1. So, right? so this guy, this, this automatically means that I can divide both sides by 1 plus x squared. And that's true. So that puts me in this situation, which means this is automatically true. Now, the guy in the middle is the guy that I care about, but I don't, we can't compute it. But the guy on the right, notice that he's a much easier integral to deal with. We can actually do that one, and in fact we did. We actually computed this, and his value was pi over 2. So I know that the, this converges. Converges. So I can say the following. This integral, 1 to infinity of cosine squared x over 1 plus x squared dx, converges by comparison. Now, I don't know what it converges to, but I know it converges. I could give you an upper bound. I can tell you whatever the answer is, it's less than pi over 2, less than or equal to pi over 2. I don't know what it is, but it's less than or equal to pi over 2. Right? And sometimes just kind of knowing roughly where something's going to land is good enough. You can't really, I can't really tell you the exact answer at this point, but it definitely has an answer. Right? And the comparison theorem, sometimes knowing that it has an answer is more important than knowing what the answer actually is. We'll talk about that later, and you'll see that in other classes too. So the comparison theorem actually helps us out. Where this guy really comes in handy is when one of these integrals is really hard to compute, so you want to use some easier integral to make the conclusion. Yeah. Oh, it, it should be the same. Oh, sorry. Sorry. This, this was supposed to be zero. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, I didn't search for keeping us honest. Uh, we will stop there. Now, by the next class, we're actually going to cover another topic where we're going to need a handout. So. Pass these around for now. Yeah. And I'll see you guys on Friday. I'll probably do a couple more examples on comparison theorem, but then we'll move on to the. Do we need you to uh, finish the problems? No, we're going to do it in class.